Welcome to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast presented by Fishhawk Electronics. If you're looking for news, tips, and stories about fishing the Great Lakes, you've come to the right place. And now your host, Chris Larson. Welcome to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast. Today, our guest is Captain Richard Hajeki from Crazy Yankee Sport Fishing. Richard, thanks for joining the show. Thank you for having me. We had you back on episode seven, and then we were talking spring brown trout fishing. Today, I just wanted to talk some fishing with you. I know we wanted to talk some salmon, too. Uh, we didn't really get a chance to talk too much about that the last time that, that you and I met. First of all, tell me about how the season went in 2020. What was that like for you? As we all know, it got uh, it got off to a rough start. I had my boat in the water prior to the shutdown. I was able to actually squeeze a charter in before they shut us down, and it was, uh, it, w- it was good. We had a lot of fun, um, but they closed us down when we have uh, some of the best fishing going on in, in April and May there on the shoreline. So we moved the boat to our home port since we couldn't charter and we uh, just went fun fishing from there and we had some really great days. I, I remember uh, waking up one day, I went down to the boat because I wanted to put a TV in the cabin. So I was down there, I slept on the boat overnight and I woke up and saw all these people going fishing. So I said, oh, why not? Jumped, uh, you know, fired the engines up, took off, and I had a limit of salmon in, in April um, in the cooler by 8.30, and I was headed back to the dock, so it was uh, it was pretty good. I wish I wish the clients had a chance to uh, experience that type of fishing, but uh, hopefully this year uh, we won't have to deal with that, and they can. Yeah, I've kind of gotten that from a couple of captains this year that, uh, you know, the great fishing was really when, when things, uh, when he couldn't take clients out, but uh, the client season was good as well. Tell me about, about how things went as soon as you could start taking out some, some guests. Well, our first charter after they opened us back up was, um, was Memorial Day weekend. And, and when we fish out of, um, for the summer, the fishing was really not that good there. And we typically be up on the west end of Lake Ontario fishing the Niagara Bar region, uh, Wilson, Alcott, those areas. So it was funny the first uh, the first charter we got to go we, we kind of went out there and, and it was just black clear water cold water and there wasn't much around the home port so we we made it about 15 miles down the lake and i just turned to my clients and said hey if i can get you a ride back to the uh, to your cars you guys want to go catch some salmon there and they all looked at each other and they're like yeah that's why we're here so we did another 15 miles down the lake ended up in front of wilson and just piled them uh piled them in the cooler and they were they were happy they they got their limit uh we had a lot of fun it was it was an interesting ride we we uh, ended up in some fog banks and couldn't really see a lot of people when we were fishing but um, with the technology we have on our boats nowadays it really wasn't too big of an issue with radar and gps and all that good stuff but after they opened us up the fishing was uh was was good and then we got into into june we started doing uh we started june with one of our own tournaments at oak orchard and uh, it's a multi-species event which we really like because you have to catch if you really want to contend for the win you really got to have uh three different species in your cooler um so we we kind of we led that after day one and we ended up finishing third in the tournament there and from there on the fishing just got better and better as we got into our summer months the salmon fishing was great the steelhead fishing offshore was great the uh the brown trout fishing inshore was great and that's the great thing about the port we fish out of at oak orchard and that's kind of one of the things i wanted to talk about today is the diverse fishery and the consistent fishery at Oak Orchard throughout the whole entire fishing season. Um, so it, w- it went great right to the end of September and then we, we put the boat up. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, let's, let's get into Oak Orchard and kind of what that fishery is like kind of as, as the year goes by and what you're targeting and, and where you're going uh, as the season kind of progresses. Sure. So we're, we're, we'll start off in the springtime. Most of the guys don't get their boats in until about April 1st. For whatever reason, April 1st is when most guys start thinking about dumping their boats in. They've gotten done working on them and waxing them and bottom painting them and whatever else. So when you get out there in April, you're typically brown trout fishing, kind of like we talked about in the podcast back in uh, last January. And you're fishing the shoreline. You're catching brown trout for the most part. You, you, you got a chance to catch a salmon or a steelhead or a lake trout in there as well. But your main fish that time of year is going to be a brown trout. And what you want to do is concentrate around the creek mouse, the river mouse, where the warm water inflows are, and that's going to attract the bait, that's going to attract the fish, and that's typically what you'll find there. Uh, what we've been doing a lot of lately in the springtime is just kind of sliding out to that next level. So instead of fishing that 15-foot or less level, sliding out to that 15-foot to 40-foot level, 
and pulling uh, big plugs with big lips like the Bayrat LXDs. And um, what we're finding out there is, you know, once that bite on the inside dies or maybe the water's a little bit too clear, you slide out there and you, you got the opportunity to catch brown trout and sometimes some better brown trout. And then you stumble across pods of salmon that time of year. And like I said uh, earlier in, in the podcast here, that's what happened in, uh, in April this year, fishing out of Oak Orchard is there was a heck of a salmon bite in that 30 to 40 foot of water um, in April. And we targeted them and we did very well on them. We brought some friends out there and just had a blast on them at times. Um, so that's kind of what the spring fishery is in, uh, at Oak Orchard. And there's always the lake trout as well. I almost forget about talking about lake trout, but if you want a lake trout fish, you just slide out to that 60 to 100 foot range in that in the April May time frame, and you can really pile drive some lake trout. And there's some good lake trout out there. You know that spring fishery is is pretty diverse. You've got three out of the four species you can actually go out and target, and and be very successful at. Um, and the one thing I want to mention about Oak Orchard is it kind of gets that tail end of that Niagara River plume. So we've got some really nutrient rich water, especially later in the season that's coming down from that Niagara region. Once we get out of that April, May, spring fishery, where you're fishing pretty shallow and you're targeting your brown trout, your salmon and your, and your lake trout, and we start to move into June, July, part of August, we call that our summer fishery. Um, and the summer fishery is once your thermocline really sets up. And for us, for me, my boat, my tournament team, we like to find where that thermocline breaks at about 60 degrees and fish below that. And what we'll find a lot of times is in that 60 to 65 degree water, we can catch some steelhead. When you get below there, then you're starting in, to get into your salmon fishery. And during those summer months, we've got a very consistent fishery where we still have the salmon to catch. The steelhead are starting to really kick on offshore and you can target those either earlier in the summer on surface lures or as a thermocline sets in, you can start to fish the thermocline for the steelhead. And then really an untapped resource on the west end of Lake Ontario because we've got that consistent salmon fishery from April through September is the brown trout fishery. Not a lot of guys target it, but when they do, they find that there's good sized brown trout and there's decent numbers of brown trout on the West End and they are basically just untouched. So when you figure out where they hang out, you can have the fishery all to yourself. Um, and then you've always got the lake trout that hang out where that colder water intersects bottom. It could be 80 foot, it could be 100 foot, it could be 200 feet, depending on what time of year it is. Um, so moving into the summer fishery, we've got that consistent uh, fishery where you could basically pick your poison. And that's the great thing about that end of the lake is there's always, you know, there's always something to fish for. And, you know, the problem that I see with a lot of fishermen is they go out and they're just, this, the salmon just attracts them to an area and that's what they want to go out and catch a salmon. Well, in, in a lot of parts of the lake, sometimes salmon isn't available. Um, so you've got to kind of go and fish for something else. And by doing that on days when you're not forced to, it helps you then on the days that you have to go fish for those fish um, to, to help locate them and, and know what to use to catch them. And that's kind of why um, coming back to the tournament we have at the Oak in June, when you got to catch three out of three species really to, to win the tournament, that's where that really comes into play and in knowing how to catch those fish, where to catch those fish. So that's the great part about the elk is the fact that the, the fishery is very consistent. There's always fish to catch there. And um, you really can pick your poison when it comes to what fish you want to you want to target. And then um, what I call the fall fishery is probably your mid-August into September. And, and once you get past Labor Day on, on a large portion of the lake, tournaments have stopped, derbies have stopped, and a lot of guys start to pull their boats because they're thinking about hunting season. And it can be one of the best times to head offshore and, uh, and fish for salmon and some really nice steelhead. Um, and it can also be a great time if you're around a big tributary to go and fish for those staging salmon. That time of year, you have, um, you've got your salmon that are mature hanging out at the creek mouse, the river mouse. You've got your salmon offshore that are immature uh, and still silver and there's still a lot of fun to catch. Even though they're next year's fish, it's, a, it's, it's, it's just another class of fish you can go target. The steelhead fishing offshore is probably the best come August and September. You're gonna get those steelhead that are nice and plump from eating all summer, 
they're bright silver, um, and they're hanging around with those two-year-old salmon, and they're very, very spunky. Uh, but if that doesn't do it for you, you've got a great brown trout fishery you can still fish for on the inside, and you've always got your lake trout that you can target. So no matter spring, summer, fall at Oak Orchard and that west end of Lake Ontario, you can basically, like I keep saying, pick your poison and, and fish for whatever species of fish you want and, and be very, fairly successful at it. Yeah, and that, that uh, summertime bite when you're, when you're out there and you said that there's, there's lots of different species you can go after. And one of the things that you touched on was being open-minded to kind of catching whatever is kind of presenting itself an opportunity to you. So when you go out and you're fishing, let's say in July, uh, I'm assuming you're heading out to the deeper water, you're dropping your stuff down. Are you putting together a setup just for salmon? And if that bite doesn't go, then we're switching gears. Are you putting a setup together where we're kind of trying to cover the whole water column and we're going to go for salmon, but we're also going to drop some stuff out for steelhead at the same time while we're out there? So the July time frame is going to be more salmon um, or, you know, your, your setup is going to be more orientated towards salmon um, and some steelhead because that's that time of year is when the salmon really start putting the pounds on. They're getting big. They're nice, bright silver. Um, so, so in the July time frame, you're going to run a spread specifically for salmon and you're going to have some stuff a little bit higher for the steelhead. If you want to move back a month into June and talk about fishing that time of year, that's the time of year where you're going to put out a spread that you are going to cover water column and you're going to cover water and you don't know what you're going to catch. So you're going to put some stuff out on the surface and that's going to potentially catch your coho and your, and your steelhead. You're going to put some stuff midwater you're going to put some stuff deep. Um, we had a charter back in June. We were fishing that same, that same pattern. So the guys on Lake Ontario, unlike Michigan, are stuck on big planer boards, and that's what they like pulling no matter what time of year it is. And when it comes to inline boards, they get real – they shy away from it, and they don't like them. And what we've found over the last couple of years is if you want to be successful in those times of year, like June and September, when you have – a large portion, of the, large portion of the water column that holds fish, you've got to be able to fish it all. So what we do is we break out the offshore planer boards and we'll run three on each side with various copper and lead core lengths and, and, and flat lines so that we're targeting the surface all the way down. So like, like I was about to say, back in June, we had a charter out. And they're guys that have their own boat and they fish out of uh, a port on the east end of Lake Ontario, but they wanted to come fishing in June on the, on the west end to see what it was like. And we were catching salmon 150 foot down in June and it just blew their mind because they were like, why would you even put something down there? But with today's technology, with electronics, you're looking at the whole water column, you see those fish down there and, you know, it's like, let's try catching that fish down there. So that's when... Uh, what I found and what we found is in, in, in the months of June, May, June, when there's really no thermal clean set up, and then into September, when there's a, a big portion of the water column that's fishy, um, covering most of the water column will actually increase the amount of bites you'll have uh, throughout the day, and, and you'll be more successful for your customers. What, what does your setup look like? I mean, how many rods are you running? You talked about running some lead core on the planer boards. How are you covering that whole, that whole water column as far as rods and... and some of your other stuff as far as, are you running dipsies, somebody down rate, are you running, what, what does that setup look like? Sure, so you know, a typical setup for us when we're just strictly salmon fishing in, in um, you know, July, August, is three downriggers. That's all we have on our boat is three downriggers. Back in the day, um, you would see guys with five and six downriggers on their boat, but as the lakes have cleared up, it seems like that stealthy um, way to go is, is gonna benefit you. So um, on our boat, we have three downriggers, three Canon Optimum downriggers. We have, um, we usually run two dipsy divers. Sometimes we'll throw in two more and add, uh, so, we, so we're running double divers on each side. And then when it comes to the, um, the what I call junk lines, we'll run uh, OR12 offshore inline boards on anything from a flat line down to about yeah, I would say at 10 colors, probably pushing it, 10 colors of uh, stealth core, lead core. And then when we start getting into the coppers, we're, we're running the or offshore OR37 boards. So anything from two, three, and 400 foot of copper. So on a typical day in June, I might have a two color 
a five collar and a 10 collar on one side. <clears throat> and then I'll have a five collar, 150 copper and a 300 copper on the other side. And then maybe if I'm getting real desperate, add another copper down the chute that's running a little bit deeper than all of those. Then basically the concepts you want to have is you want to keep the lines that are higher in the water column out to the side as far as, far as possible. And as, as you get closer to the boat, those are going to be your deeper lines, the, the, your, your junk lines that will run a little bit deeper. And this kind of helps with avoiding tangles when the outside boards uh, catch a fish. And then that's something you really can't do with those big planer boards that guys on Lake Ontario have come accustomed to running. You're really limited to one rod on, on, on each side. And a lot of times if you're just running two different junk lines, you're missing out on a big portion of the water column. Richard, tell me a little bit about some of your favorite lures when you're going after salmon. What, what's kind of your go-to? And I guess one of the ways that I like to phrase this question is, you're going to go salmon fishing and you can take two lures out on the boat with you. What are they going to be? We are a big, uh, a big meat pulling boat. So I love running uh, meat and I love to run meat at those fish that a lot of people don't really target. So we've, done, we've been really successful in tournaments and, and over the years fishing it deeper than most. And, and we'll fish meat down to 225, 250 feet in Lake Ontario at times. So uh, my absolute favorite way to, to fish is to watch my, my Hummingbird electronics. And when I see those deep marks, I get like this big happy smile on my face and I just take a, a heavy weight, drop my cannon downrigger down there. Um, and when I see that rod start to twitch, it's like game on, you know. Um, so that's probably, I, I would say, a big um, white paddle with crushed glow on one side and, and probably the, the silver squiggles on the other. A Twinkie rig and familiar bite meat just down in that ice cold water, 150, 200 feet down is probably one of my favorite ways to catch them. And then I've really uh, taken, so, so this is a, a pattern or a, a way to fish that we've, we learned fishing the spring tournament over in St. Catharines in, in April and pulling big cranks for, for salmon in, in that skinny water, like I was talking about earlier, has, uh, has really become a lot of fun. And that's behind, again, OR12 offshore inline boards. Uh, just pulling that Bay Red LXD 100 feet, 125 feet behind a board and watching the salmon rip that thing back. And it always, it, it, you're only fishing in 20, 30, 40 foot of water, so they don't have anywhere to go but away from you or at you. It's a, it's a really fun way to catch them. And it's, it's not a method you can use on a, portion, a big portion of the lake. It's really, it's really the West End that gets that skinny water salmon fishery consistently every year. And uh, so, so that's kind of been a lot of fun lately. So uh, if we were talking springtime, I'd say cranks behind, uh, behind inline boards. But as we get into the summertime, I'm probably going to pull a big paddle with meat down deep. Or one of my favorite spoons is a spoon that I came up with probably 10 or 11 years ago. It's called a seasick wather. And Dreamweaver uh, makes a really good seasick wather. And uh, it's typically one of the spoons that will go down first thing in the morning on one of the downrakers. Um, and and one of the terms and one of the ways we fish them um, that became popular with the oak, and you see it a lot in my fishing reports, is called a mup rig. And basically it means mag up. So what we do is we'll run the regular size spoon on the uh, main line, and then we will use a uh, half inch rubber band and run a, a pin cheater 10 feet above it with a mag size of the same color. So. Um, that's probably one of my other favorite rigs. So those, the meat rig and, and the mop rig are probably my two favorite rigs when I'm targeting salmon. Rich, tell me a little bit about the way the structure sets up. You, you alluded to it earlier with uh, you're still getting some of that Niagara flow into there. But let's talk a little bit about the structure as you're heading out of port. What does it look like? How does it drop off? What are you fishing? What are you looking for uh, as far as structure and how you're setting your gear up as you go out and and what are you watching for as you kind of determine your way out, out of the harbor? So the structure at Oak Orchard is, uh, is pretty cool. So if you, if you look at a map, we're, we're kind of situated between Rochester and the Niagara River. And if uh, you'll notice that we're probably the furthest north part of the South Shore. Uh, so when you leave Oak Orchard, it gets deep pretty quick. And when I want to get to 100 foot of water, it's probably less than a mile run for us. When I want to get to five or 600 feet of water, you know, we don't have to go more than six miles, I would say, to get out there. So we can get some, some decent water below us and get to fishing that deep stuff later in the year. But as you 
if you're looking about the looking at the inshore fishery uh, to the east of Oak Orchard, there's uh, a ledge over there and we call it the flats. And basically it's an area that you fish and you can actually see the parkway where the cars are driving by. And in, in over the years, it's, it's known as a really great spot for staging fish in August. And actually the biggest fish to hit our boat came from there um, about 10 years ago uh, when we were fishing there. So, um, and if you keep going further east, you come into a point called Devil's Nose, which is a lot of structure. It holds some good, uh, some good area for lake trout and brown trout. Uh, and we've fished that quite a bit. And if you go a little bit further, you run into an area called Watoma Shoals, which after the spring lake trout bite on the West End is probably the best area on Lake Ontario South Shore to fish lake trout and, and catch uh, numbers as well as size. Um, so there's, there's quite a bit of structure around Oak Orchard. Um, and that's, I think, what, what helps it be so consistent year after year. Tell me a little, you've been talking tournament and charter fishing. You do both. Kind of the main differences that you see between a guy that's going to go out and fish tournaments and somebody who's going to uh, take clients out and do that type of thing. What are the main differences between those two types of fishing? There's a lot of great fishermen on this lake that can't fish tournaments. And I see it all the time. My biggest thing with fishing tournaments, when I first started fishing tournaments, I'm sure I lost some friends over it because I had a chip on my shoulder and I wanted to prove myself. But over the years, I've seen friends that fish tournaments and they're hard on themselves. And what ends up doing is it ends up folding that, they're, that team folds, they don't ever fish tournaments again and they kind of get out, get out of tournament fishing. What we do is we show up and we try to have fun. And when I say fun, I mean, we're out there with friends most of the time we do charter occasionally for tournaments um we eat well and uh you know it, and we just whatever happens happens it's you know sometimes things are just out of your control um in a, in a good in a good example of that is we we, we brought the boat down to sodas to fish the wayne county pro-am this summer i haven't fished it in probably nine years just because it's kind of the other end of the lake and and we typically didn't go down there we, we, most of the tournaments happen on the west end of the lake. So we end up going down there and we go out on day one and we crush it. And we make a boneheaded mistake where we just, we, we measured a fish that we thought was legal and it's legal by New York state standards. It's legal, um, you know, when you're charter fishing to put that fish in the box, but by tournament rules, it wasn't legal. It was an illegal fish. And we, we figured that out after the fish got put in the cooler. And one of the rules is, hey, once a fish hits the cooler, that's a fish. So we ended up finishing out our, our box, even though we had that extra fish in there. And right before we weighed in, I went and talked to the, uh, the tournament, tournament control or, or the, the person running the tournament and told them what happened. They ended up disqualifying our box, but our, we would have been sitting in second place after day one. And, and um, we ended up with a big zero. So we had no shot at winning any money in the tournament. And, and a lot of people came up to me and, and said, you know, that was, that was an, that was a good thing for you to do. I could have just hid that fish and not worried about it, but I don't need that kind of reputation and because I, I enjoy fishing tournaments and I want people to think, and I want people to know that we follow the rules, okay? You know, we got up the next morning and we went fishing and we pretended we were still in the tournament and we weighed in a box of fish, right? So we went out and we had fun and that's what we do. And, um, and we ended up bringing in another giant box and we probably would have ended up in second place in that tournament because the guys who won it just crushed it. Um, but getting back to it is when you're fishing a tournament, you got to have fun. You, you know, some guys put so much stress on themselves and get so, so worried about how they finish and it, it just burns them out and they can't do it, but they can go out day in and day out and catch fish for their clients. Um, so fishing tournaments, my, my, my one thing that I tell people is go out and have fun and, and, and go fish with a, a bunch of guys that you can have fun with. You know, some guys just take things too serious. And you can't do that when you're tournament fishing. One of the things that uh, you keep saying too is over the years. So you've been you've been doing this for a few years. Uh, I'm going to let you tell us how long you've been doing it. But tell us a little bit about how things have changed in uh, fishing Lake Ontario since you started till today. Oh yeah. So I've my father had my brother and I out in the lake when we were like five and six years old. So doing the math. Um, I've been fishing the, the lake for about 35 years now. Most of it was with my father tagging along as an obnoxious kid. But um, 
you know, the last, uh, I'd say, 13 years, we've been doing it as a, as a profession and chartering out there. Um, we started off fishing tournaments and then worked our way into the charter, the charter business, and now we do both. Over the years, uh, the tournaments, the, the size of tournaments, I think, have gotten smaller, but there's more tournaments to fish on the lake. Um, so back in the day, there, there seemed to be three or four big tournaments on Lake Ontario, and then there was a the couple of derbies. Uh, now, I was looking at the schedule, and there's literally a tournament every weekend from the end of April through Labor Day, if you can cross the border, which we can't right now. But, I mean, that's how many tournaments are on Lake Ontario. Um, so, for one, the tournament scene has gotten bigger. Um, as far as the fishing goes, with the internet and with social media and all the stuff that's out there, the learning curve has gotten a lot smaller. So I, all the stuff I've done over the last 35 years, there's guys coming out of here right now and, and they don't have more than four or five years of fishing experience on Lake Ontario. They're going out and getting their charter captain's license and running charters just because they were able to narrow down that learning curve and figure it out. And it's helped that the fishing has been amazing too over the last how many, uh, last four or five, six years, the fishing has been great. So it doesn't take a whole lot of experience to go out there and catch some fish. Um, so the two biggest things that really hit me is the fact that more tournaments have popped up over the years. There's, um, the learning curve has really gotten small. I mean, guys that can go out there in 16, 18 foot boats with a couple of downriggers and a couple of dipsy divers can be very successful. Um, they don't have to, there's not a lot of whole, not a lot of trial and error anymore when it comes to that stuff. And then the, the last thing I think I'll touch on over the years is the size of the fish, especially in the, in the salmon world of kind of it's kind of decreased. So back in 99, we had a really good crop of fish show up and, and there was multiple fish caught over 40 pounds uh, in the, in the fall derby. I think the top 10 fish in our fall derby, which runs about 10 days were over 40 pounds. Um, we haven't taken a 30 pound salmon probably in four or five years now, just because your, your average size salmon has, has shrunk. Um, they're still healthy but we're just not seeing those giant salmon anymore. Um, and that's kind of one of the biggest things that I wish would change and we could figure out how to get those salmon back up in that 30, 35, 40 pound range. But um, those are the three things that I've seen that have changed in the fishery the most that really stick out in my mind. I know you're not a biologist, but I'm gonna ask you to play one here. What, what, mm -hmm. what, why, are, why are we not seeing the size that you saw 20 years ago? What's going on in the fishery now that, that wasn't happening then? I keep up with uh, a lot of the biologists and I'm friends with some of the biologists and I, and I, it, just the other day I was out on a, a customer's boat yesterday and he was comp complaining about uh, not complaining but saying uh, you know my electronics don't work great over deep water so yesterday I was out in 350 foot of water with him showing him how to use his electronics and um, I marked a pot of bait on the bottom and I marked some fish that were suspended up above the bottom a little bit um, but I think and getting back to that story, so I, I sent one of the biologists a, a snapshot of that picture showing them what I was seeing out deep. But what the biologists are saying is that the, the biomass itself is kind of shrunk, so the fish don't have as much to eat. And I, I think I've kind of seen that, and I can relate to that by what I'm seeing on my electronics. Uh, and some people don't think we have an issue when it comes to our fishery and in and, and the, the lower levels in the food chain, but the reality is the, the phosphorus levels in all the Great Lakes have dropped, right? So the bottom of your food chain is getting worse. So that means as you go off the ladder, um, you know, those are going to kind of get cut down as well. So we know that back in, I don't know, I think it was 13 or 14, we had a couple of harsh winters that um, kind of put a hurting on our young of the year. And a young of the year alewife, which alewife is our main forage base in Lake Ontario, the young of the year alewife really is, uh, they really are affected by harsh winters. So we lost a couple of year classes there. Um, as I was speaking earlier about the lower levels of the, of the food chain, as those diminished, our, our alewife, they tend not to live as long as they used to. So back in the day, we would have alewife for that seven, eight, nine year old um, age. Now we've got alewife from zero to about six years. So when you lost two year classes back in the 80s, you had nine year classes to play with. And if you had two bad ones in there, big deal. 
but now that you have two bad year classes in six years from what they're saying over at the, you know, the biologists are telling us, um, now you've got a, a little bit of an issue here. So um, right now we're at the point where those mature alewife this past summer were part of that um, year close, those year classes that kind of got decimated by those hard, win hard, hard winners, right? So I think what we're seeing is, is just a simple case of there's not a ton of food out there for them to reach those larger sizes. Uh, that's why we're not seeing our 30 and 40 pound salmon as much. There's just not the food out there. I mean, um, a good friend of mine talks about L life like popcorn. I mean, L life are just like popping popcorn. You can eat a lot of it, but it's, there's really no nutritional value there. Um, when we had big salmon, we had big, big smelt runs and smelt are a little more nutritious than an L life. So we had that variety of food out there for them and it seemed to grow those salmon bigger, faster. And again, I'm not a biologist, but I'm just going by what these guys are telling me. Richard, is there something that you wanted to talk about today that I, I didn't ask you about? Yeah, I just wanted to go over um, just the, the atmosphere at Oak Orchard, Oak Orchard as a whole. It's a great charter port. So when you go out of there in the summertime, you could see 100, 150 boats out there fishing and a good portion of our charter boats. And, and, and there's also um, a lot of recreational boats. But um, because of its consistent fishery over the years, it's a great spot um, to get out and go fishing. And, and one of the things I love about it is the marina life. Because you have so many charter captains and, it's, and the fishing is so good, a lot of the guys really get along. So at five o'clock in the morning, there's a cafe that opens up and you'll see charter captains sitting around a table, drinking coffee, eating breakfast, waiting for their clients to show up. And I don't think there's anywhere else in the lake that you can, you can find that. On blow off days at that same cafe, those captains are hanging out there eating breakfast and talking about the good old days. Again, I don't know if there's any place in the lake that, um, that you can say that that happens. Um, you know, so the camaraderie there is great. You know, it's a small, quiet port in a in a in a in a in a, in a quiet town. Uh, in a quiet town, and it's got two great launches. And the information that comes out of there to help the recreational angler is amazing. Um, after every fishing report, I have pictures and um, in a, a fishing report on our Facebook page. You've got another captain by the name of Bob Sangen who does um, video reports after just about every one of his charters. Um, and there's and there's multiple other charter operations out of there that, that give out fishing reports every day or whenever they're out. So if you're looking for information, there's a wealth of information at Oak Orchard and their captains and they're willing to help um, guys catch more fish. There's also quite a few tournaments there. So over the years, we've, uh, we've built this tournament series up called King of the Oak where we have, I think there's four tournaments throughout the year at different parts of the year. And you accumulate those points throughout the year. And at the end of the year, we crown a king of the oak. Um, so if you're into the tournament fishing scene, and, and those are fairly inexpensive to get involved in. They're about $100 to, uh, to enter. But if, you're, if you want to get started in tournament fishing, those are great tournaments um, to, uh, to enter and be a part of. And other than that, that's it. I just wanted to, uh, to highlight that port and, and the fishery there and the consistency of it. Well, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing some of your, sharing your time. It's fun to talk to you, and I, I love listening to you kind of tell your stories and, and talk about the things that you're doing. And uh, I, I always have been following your Facebook page. Tell me a little bit about where people can find you if they want to know more about you. Sure. So we've got a website, crazyyankeesportfishing.com. Um, on that website, there is a blog where, again, all my pictures from every charter and fishing report, um, they're uploaded to that every every weekend after my charters. Um, our Facebook page uh, is Crazy Yankee Sport Fishing. You can find us there. Again, pictures and reports are always there and anything else that's going on that I think is relevant to the fishery or just fun um, gets posted there. We also have an Instagram page, Crazy Yankee Sport Fishing, doc, or just Crazy Yankee Sport Fishing, I should say. And I guess those probably the three uh, easiest ways to get a hold of us or see what's going on. And, uh, and, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me off of those or send me a message off of those pages. And, and uh, I get questions all the time about, um, you know, lure colors that I mentioned in our reports or um, the big thing that we've been, you know, that people have been contacting me for recently are marine electronics. So uh, I get a lot, of, a lot of questions on that because, uh, because of my dealings in uh, marine electronics. So that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Awesome. Captain Richard Hojecki from Crazy Yankee Sport Fishing. 
Thanks so much for doing the show. Thanks for listening to the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast presented by Fishhawk Electronics. For more information on fishing the Great Lakes, visit our blog at fishhawkelectronics.com.